And with that, I am incredibly excited to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Larray Simpson. Larray is one of my colleagues at Florida Oceanographic Society, so this is an extra special lecture for us. Larray is the Director of Scientific Research and Conservation, and she has a PhD in soil and water ecology from the University of Florida with an emphasis on mangrove ecology. She was previously a postdoctoral associate at the University of Florida and at the University of Alabama. Plus, she spent eight years working with the Smithsonian Field Station in Fort Pierce, conducting mangrove and salt marsh research all around the state of Florida. Tonight, she's gonna to be sharing some of that mangrove-related research with us. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Larray Simpson. All right, thank you, Zach. I appreciate the very warm welcome. And I'm excited to see everybody here today and to spend the evening with you. I'm actually very truly honored to be able to hang out with you in your living room amid these times and to tell you a story, a natural history story that is actually really near and dear to my heart. As Zach said, I've spent almost the last decade working in this system uh, here in Florida, especially. And so to be able to tell this story is really, really cool. And so the talk that I'm going to give today is going to be a mix of basic mangrove ecology and the work that I have done with collaborators both nationally and internationally over the last decade. But before we get into the nitty gritty of these ma migrating mangroves and what they're up to, but we really need to just start with the basics. Let's find this laser. All right, so many of you are probably very familiar with these ubiquitous trees along the Indian River Lagoon, as well as other brackish and even freshwater waterways here in Florida. I'm sure that you can pick out the, the red mangroves with their big prop roots, as well as the black mangroves with once they get to a certain age, you can tell that they're black by their black bark. And if you're really good, you have a really good trained eye, you can probably pick out the white mangroves because their leaves have this really bright green color that is very different from the other two mangroves in this system. But the term mangrove doesn't necessarily um, just talk about trees. It doesn't refer to a specific taxonomic group of these species. It actually refers to species that are able to grow in saline soils. And these species are found all over the tropics and the subtropics. And so while here in Florida, we have these three trees that make up mangroves, if you went to other parts of the world, you would run into a mangrove fern, a mangrove hibiscus, um, a mangrove palm. And so it's very interesting to note that while we just have these trees here, there are different, there's like a stage of different classifications that make a mangrove a mangrove. So a mangrove obviously is very different than a salt marsh grass. But what are those? And so the first one is kind of general and kind of obvious, but these mangroves only occur in the mangrove environment and does not extend in terrestrial communities. So the niche that mangroves can live in or the area that mangroves can live in is very narrow, right? They need to be in saline soils or they can live in saline soils. They're tidally inundated once or twice a day. And this really outcompetes a lot of the other species or those terrestrial species that can't live in these um, situations. And so in order for a mangrove to be a mangrove, they have to be able to live in these very narrow niches. And to do so, they have morphological specializations uh, or adaptations to that environment. And so for example, these roots, these prop roots that we mentioned, these big red prop roots, or the pneumatophores that are found in black mangroves, those allow the tree to breathe when all of the roots underground are underwater. Just like you and I, a plant can't survive by being underwater, it will drown. And so these roots above water, they act to pull in oxygen when the trees are inundated and shunt oxygen down below to keep the tree alive. Another morphological specialization that these trees have is vivipary, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but essentially what this means is when you see a mangrove propagule floating in the water or one on the tree, what happens is that propagule actually germinates before it leaves the parent plant. 
So in many terrestrial species, when you get a seed, the seed is dormant until it's exposed to fire or it gets water or it's kind of um, rubbed upon. Mangroves don't do that. The second the propio falls off of the tree, it's now a plant. And it can float indefinitely, well, not indefinitely, it can float for a certain amount of time until it finds habitat or substrate that it can um, land in. And when it's there, it will start to put out roots. But while it's floating, it's already putting out roots because it's an active plant at that point. And that allows these plants to get to places that they wouldn't necessarily be in otherwise. Another thing that makes a mangrove a mangrove is a physiological mechanism for salt exclusion and or salt excretion. So just like you and I, we can't survive on drinking salt water all day. We will get dehydrated and we will end up dying. Plants do the same thing. Mangroves have figured out a way to number one, be able to exclude salt from even coming into their system. And so for example, these red mangrove prop roots, when it pulls water in, it is able to make sure that the salt does not come in with the water. As opposed to the black mangrove, when it pulls water in, it actually pulls all the salt water into the plant, and then it excretes that salt through the leaf. So if you're ever walking out in a mangrove forest, go ahead, find a black mangrove, flip it over, and a lot of times you'll see thick salt crystals on the back of it. And that is what it's doing. It's getting rid of that salt water that would otherwise kill it. These specializations right here, they allow these plants to live in that very narrow niche, right? And because they've been able to evolve over time with these adaptations, they are taxonomically isolated from their terrestrial relatives. So they are not related to other species that are found upland. So they're not related to salt marsh at all. And so these four things, which have some little categories underneath of it, really makes a mangrove a mangrove. And in terms of looking at mangroves across the world, there are 73 species and recognized hybrids of these mangroves, and they're found in 123 countries. And so if you look at this map here, it's a little difficult to discern, but these black lines are, is where mangroves are found. And then this, the gray lines are where you find salt marsh. And you can see that there's a very fine line as to where salt marsh and mangrove take over from one another. And this is about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And what keeps mangroves in check and what has historically is freezing temperatures. So mangroves do not like it when it gets cold. They are not good at it. They're like a typical Floridians. It gets cold, they put on their Ugg boots and their sweaters and they're over it. These guys, if you have them frozen for a few hours a night, for three or four nights in a row, they will die. And so where their northernmost range of distribution falls out, that's where you have salt marsh that interlaps with that. And so salt marsh does really well in the cold, right? Because it usually dies back in the winter. And so where mangroves aren't, salt marsh flourishes. So in the United States, we find mangroves not only here in Florida, but we find them in Louisiana as well as in Texas. And so here, this is a model that was done where you can see mangroves are in the black and salt marsh here is in the white. Now, with warmer winters, we are seeing mangrove rage expansion take place. And we're seeing not only that they're expanding, but they're overtaking the salt marsh because they fall on that very narrow niche, right? So if you're not gonna have those warmer winter or those cooler winters, you are gonna see mangroves start to take over the salt marsh over time. So effectively, one day we may be looking around and not only see mangroves in Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, but we might see them in Georgia, as well as Alabama and Mississippi. Now, each of these places has very different conversations in terms of how mangrove encroachment is happening, what the degree and the trajectory is. So tonight, I just wanna focus on Florida, specifically the Atlantic coast of Florida. So for many of you that are from here, you know that mangroves are found down here in South Florida. For all intents and purposes, this is just a pure mangrove stand. You have your red mangroves, your white mangroves, and your black mangroves. Right around the Sebastian Inlet, this is where you start to hit the ecotone. And the ecotone is where you have two overlapping habitat distributions. So in this area, you have mangroves that are at the northernmost range of their distribution, 
integrating with salt marsh that's at its southernmost range of distribution. So they're kind of just jockeying for position. They're trying to outcompete one another or live with one another. And you have this ecotone from, like I said, Sebastian all the way up to the St. Augustine area. Above that, you have pure salt marsh. So you go up just beautiful Spartina marshes as far as the eye can see. Now, here on the East Coast, we have noted that these mangroves are migrating. So a researcher back in 2014 got a paper out that used satellite data to show that mangroves were moving north. And not only were they moving north, but they were increasing their area and their extent within that ecotome. So right here from about Port St. Lucie all the way up to St. Augustine, he was able to show that over 28 years, there was an increase of mangrove area and extent from about 20 to 120%. And so when you went out and looked at these salt marshes before that was as far as the eye could see, you saw mangroves in there. You saw these little pups of mangroves that were hanging out. And so the question is, you know, as you see the shifting in a habitat, how is that affecting the ecosystem services that the habitat provides? And so Dr. Kavanaugh was able to show this using satellite data, which is amazing. We were also watching this really unfold right under our noses. As we're starting this project, we had put out permanent plots. So you demarcate certain areas along the Atlantic coast of Florida. We had this plot here in, um, what was this, North Peninsula State Park in Ordman Beach. And this is just a pure salt marsh plot. You have Betis and Salicornia, where some succulent forb salt marsh plants. And you know, the idea was to look at the difference between the salt marsh as opposed to the mangrove plots that were behind it. So we know we were in this ecotone, but what was going to happen if these systems shifted into one another? Well, in 2018, I decided I needed to go out and do another experiment. I needed to look more at this salt marsh mangrove ecotone, what was going on. So I walked out there to this same plot, and lo and behold, it had changed completely. There were 252 trees that established in that plot in just three years. So we saw 168% increase in above ground biomass in that system, which we were not expecting to see. And subsequently, my entire summer project had changed very, very rapidly. But this has proven not to be a very dynamic process. You know, we saw it on the satellite data from 1984. We're seeing it unfold in our eyes. But we realized very quickly that this was just not taking place in this small snapshot in time. And so let's focus on this area for a moment. Right here, this is up in northern Florida, uh, right? It's about 30 minutes south of St. Augustine. This is the Matanzas Inlet. Right here is Fort Matanzas National Monument, uh, A1A right here. And this is one of our sites. So we do most of our projects right here in this little spit of land. And what we had one of the collaborators do is he was able to compile historic aerial photography from 1942 to 1980. And so these are just pictures. If you go back and look, you can see right here, there's that lake that is very apparent in these pictures. And you have the green that are mangrove the yellow or the orange is such salt marsh, and then the gray is water. And you can see that we saw a huge increase from 1942 to 1952 in mangrove cover. And then there was kind of a shift of where the mangrove cover fell out in 1971, and then a huge decrease in 1980. It was pushed to the margins. So that historical area of photography was really good up until 1980. And then from 1995 to about 2004, we had some amazing multispectral high resolution satellite imagery, which we were able to use to show that after 1980, there was a huge crash in that mangrove population. And it was only found in the center of that little spit. And then it increased by 2004, 2008, 2013, and I can tell you right now in 2021 that this would all be green if he did this again. And so if you take this picture data 
and you make it, you put, make a graph, a graphical representation of this. So this is what you have. You have time on the x-axis down here from 1942 to 2012. You have your total area and percentage on the y-axis. Your mangrove is the solid line, and your salt marsh is the dotted line. And as you can see, as mangroves increase in their area and extent, salt marsh decreases. And they kind of flip-flop. And this is, would be obvious to a scientist. You know, we're competing for space, we're competing for light, and so when you have more mangroves, you're going to see a decrease in salt marsh. And then in less mangroves, you're going to see more salt marsh. But the question is, why were we seeing this? What was driving this change in mangrove distribution? And so you start to dig around in some old literature, you start to dig around in citrus of reports of impact freezes. And lo and behold, there were some very extreme freezes that took place. There was one in 1940 that killed back most of the mangroves. As you can also tell here, you know, this is, there was not very many left. Then you had one in 1956, um, and then followed by six more that included three impact freezes. And I didn't know what an impact freeze was until I started doing this project. And apparently it's a freeze that is so noteworthy in the citrus industry because it kills all of the Florida citrus. And so people take note of when there's impact freezes because we're talking about a huge economic loss. And so we had the data to show that if the citrus are dead, the mangroves are likely dead. So we know why they're dying, right? But why are we seeing these steep increases after that mortality or after these mortalities? And not only are they happening, but they're happening at a very rapid trajectory. And so to understand this, we need to talk a little bit more about the life history of a mangrove. I'm sure many of you are very comfortable with red mangrove propagules, especially if you go out on the boat or walk the beach, you'll see the red mangrove propagules. Um, people will like to say that they're the string beans of the sea. We have our black mangrove propagules right here, which are kind of the size of a big lima bean. And then white mangroves down here, which they fall off the tree green, but they turn brown really quickly. So if you do catch them, they look like a sunflower seed floating in the water or in a rack line. And so these propagules, they obviously each tree has its own size and they come in these different shapes and these different sizes that allow them to get to certain areas or to float for different amounts of time. And so these mangrove propagules, they fall into the water and depending on their size, that's how much energy they have stored and that's how, much, how long they can sit in the water before they actually have to be planted into the soil. So red mangroves can actually float up to a year and then still be viable. So you can pick up a mangrove propagule that's been floating for a year or even sitting on a lab bench, put it in the ground and it will still grow. Black mangroves, they can last about three months and white mangroves can only last about two weeks. And this is really because of the size of the propagules, right? There's just the maternal storage in there, the amount of energy. So these, these propagules have the potential to float for long distances. Another very important piece to this puzzle is that propagules fall from the trees between September and January. So if we go back to our graph and we look at these huge increases right around 1942, right around 2004, what do we think could be happening? I'm sure many of you have it because propagule development and drop coincides with the hurricane season. Hurricanes come through and they rip these things off of the trees, they fall in the water, and then because of high tides and storm surge and winds, these propagules are able to get into areas that they wouldn't actually be able to get to if there wasn't a hurricane. And so in 1944, we had the Cuba, Florida hurricane, which clearly increase the trajectory and the distance that these mango propagules could get to. Then in 2004, I'm sure many of you remember, unfortunately, that that was a very active hurricane season for us. And not only here in Fort Pierce, Stewart, Martin area, but as well as the entirety of the state, which allowed propagules to disperse into places farther north that they wouldn't necessarily be before.
So it's the persistence of this mangrove ecosystem that really depends on the potential of the propagules to disperse. So long distance dispersal in these mangroves is fundamentally important and is well utilized, especially in times of the hurricanes. So to really hit that home, though, there wasn't really any data on that. You know, we're, we're postulating this. We, you know, we're thinking that mangroves are helping push these, we're thinking that hurricanes are helping push these mangroves into places that they weren't. But we needed the data. And so back in 2014, what we did is we went out and we did a lot of beach walks. And yes, to my family and friends who are watching this, I have been paid to go on long walks on the beach, but I did collect data and I did run transects. And so what we did is we literally walked and ran transects along these rack lines. And along these transects, we would count propagules. We would just put down a transect or put down a plot and count what you saw. In 2014, there was no storm that year. So we walked many different beaches and many different inlets along the entirety of the Atlantic coast. And we did surveys of the beaches at the inlets as well as those beaches because that would tell us, number one, if propagules were able to make it to a certain latitude. And then we looked at the inlets because if they were able to make it to that latitude and make it to the inlet, that means that if they got into the inlet, they could find suitable habitat. And so in 2014, as you can see, didn't find anything. There was one, two, no, just not even. There was nothing. Lots of beach walks. Then, Hurricane Irma in 2017 hit, which was very stressful for personal life, but very exciting for the science life. And what we found when we went back to every single one of those places, of those inlets and those beaches that we walked, is there was a huge increase of black mangrove propagule dispersal to the Atlantic coast. And so we found where, you know, there was no propagules before, there were 10 propagules per meter square. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but all you need is one. You need one mangrove to get somewhere and to establish, and that will start a new population and a perpetuation of a population. Not only did we go and count these mangroves, and right down here, you can't, we probably can't see it very well, but there are black mangroves in all these little circles. And so they're getting shunted in in these rack lines. But not only did we do this count, we collected a bunch and we sent these off to a collaborator who did some genetic analyses on them. And so what he was doing was he was using population genetics to look at the dispersal distance for mangrove propagules by this hurricane. And without getting into all the nitty gritties of genetic analyses, what he found was that propagules from Cedar Key were actually found all the way around 620 miles later in the Matanzas Inlet. Propagules from the Everglades were found all the way up in the Matanzas Inlet. And so these mangroves were traveling extensive distances and not only were they getting there, but they were still viable and they were still able to grow. And so it's funny because a lot of times people will talk about, oh, I don't want mangroves in my house or on my property. I don't want mangroves up in my salt marsh, you know, get them out. Mangroves will get there. And so just give them the time, give them the space, give them the hurricanes. They will show up even if it takes them 620 miles. And so if we bring it all back together in this conversation about expansion being dynamic, we know it's happening. We know that these mangroves are going long distances. We know that a lot of this is driven by temperature, right? So we had a collaborator that reconstructed a mangrove suitability model time series. And essentially what this is, is this is just a model that's run based on minimum temperatures over um, historical time period. So pulling old data. And this line just shows minimum temperatures and then you have this mangrove suitability. This is a unitless measure. So from zero to five to one, you have mangrove dominated system, and then 0 0.5 to zero, you have a salt marsh dominated system. And you can see there's a lot of variability that this model picked up. And this is just the computer program that's running this model, right? It's just saying based on the temperature, mangrove should or should not be there. Well, 
one of the collaborators spent probably five plus years digging through old maps, sailing charts, journals, diaries, beekeeping newsletters, citrus reports, and was able to match up eyewitness accounts or primary literature that collab collaborated with the model. And so there's a lot of words on here, but there are converse or there are, there's peer review or primary literature, I'm sorry, where William Bartred made mention of mangroves being in Anastasia Island, which is up by St. Augustine in 1766. John Muir actually wrote about them in the 1800s being on Fernandina Beach. There is actually a paper that was written on manatees. There was a severe freeze back, I think, in the 1890s um, that they were talking about manatee mortality, but there was a side note that said nearly every mangrove tree along the Indian River was dead, which blows my mind because out in the Indian River now, these trees are tall, they look great, but at one time they were completely wiped out. Another interesting thing that she pulled was that prior to the freeze, the black mangrove um, was used as an important source of honey. So there was a honey industry in north uh, eastern Florida. And so in these beekeeping journals, they reported how the freezes how were destroying entire stands of that honey producing tree. And so it's just so fascinating to find these snippets of mangrove ecology as a side note but they're really important to understand the life history and the ecology of the species. Well, another really cool thing, and then I'll get off of this expansion, this dynamic, is she went through a bunch of photo archives. And so, you know, these people are on vacation or someone's taking a picture for a postcard. And by looking at these photos, you're able to see where mangroves were. So this is a picture right now of Fort Matanzas up in St. Augustine, right by the area where we do a lot of our work. And in 1905 and 1908, there's no mangroves. You can see the people standing up here, the women in their long dresses, the guys in their bolo hats. And then in 1917, or 1916 and 1927, you see huge mangroves at the base of the fort. And then by 1964, they're gone, but they're there, they're tiny, but those big ones are not. 1969, completely gone on this back side of the fort. But now if you stand up in that turret and you look out, these are all mangroves dotting the salt marsh landscape. And so it's just so fascinating to be able to kind of put this together like an ecological detective by using sources that we wouldn't have noticed before. And so to bring it all together, you can see that mangroves and salt marshes have been going back and forth for a while now. But besides this increase in temperature that has changed, so we're seeing these milder winters, we're also seeing coastal eutrophication. So 65% of our U.S. estuaries and coastal body, water bodies are moderately to severely degraded by excessive nutrient inputs. I think a lot of us here in this area understand that a lot with our discharges and the sewers water and just pollution that gets into the Indian River as well as the St. Lucie Estuary. And so this is happening all over the country, right? But we need to remember that the plants that live on those very narrow niches that live in the water, they are the first ones that are going to get those nutrients. And so we know that a certain level of nutrients can be good for growth, right? especially if it's a limiting nutrient. If you give a plant nitrogen and it is a limiting nutrient, it's going to grow more. And so you have this water that has all these nutrients and floating around it in it. And now these plants that live on the coast are getting these nutrients daily in their tides. So twice a day when the water goes in, it's depositing those nutrients, it's leaving, and then it's coming in and flushing with a new set of nutrients. And so the question is we wanted to test whether or not the mangroves at the northernmost range of their distribution are nutrient limited. And if they are, is this helping their encroachment into salt marsh up north? And so to do that, we have to go back to our little spit of land that we love and adore. And this is what the system looks like. 
so this are or these are scrub Abyssinia germanus or scrub black mangroves, very different than the mangroves that we're used to down here in South Florida. And what we did was we went out and we picked a series of trees. We picked several trees to just fertilize with nitrogen. We picked several trees just to fertilize with phosphorus. And then we picked several trees that we just left alone. Those are the control. We need something to compare this nutrient project to, right? So this experiment was set up in 2012. And before we started the experiment, we went through and we measured the height of each tree. So you can see that we started, here's our control tree, our nitrogen tree, and our phosphorus tree. All the trees are the exact same height. Well, we go back in 2016 and we take those same measurements. We've been fertilizing these trees every single year. And what did we see? A huge increase in growth in the nitrogen tree. So the control tree and the phosphorus tree, they perform the same, which suggests to us that phosphorus is not a living nutrient in the system, but nitrogen is. There were, the nitrogen trees grew 24 centimeters more than the control and the phosphorus trees over that time period. I think the best way to see it though is to see it visually. So here's a picture of the control tree. Each tree has a PVC pole that's stuck right next to it so we can put our important information on it, tag it, make sure we don't step on it. This is the control tree. You can see the PVC pole just fine. Here's the phosphorus tree, same vantage point. And then you have your nitrogen tree, which is completely covered up now by the canopy of the nitrogen enriched tree. And so not only are we seeing these trees get taller, but we figured out a little bit later that they're getting wider. So as these trees got taller, like we're used to here in Florida, right? The trees go straight up, they have a big canopy up high. These trees, while they were getting taller, they were getting just bigger. And so by increasing that area, which you can see here in this nitrogen tree, as opposed to these control and phosphorus, which should stay the same, they are effectively outcompeting the salt marsh species. And this is through light limitation, through nutrient absorption. So these trees get big, the mang or the salt marsh dies back. And so now we know that these mangroves can persist in these areas without freezes. And the nutrients are actually helping them to encroach and outcompete the salt marsh quicker. So we were very proud of ourselves. We figured this out. We showed that mangroves were moving north, nutrients were helping the spread of these mangroves, and then disaster hits. In January of 2018, it froze. It froze for three nights in a row, and we got down to very, very chilly temperatures. And so we walk out there, and part of us are crying because there went all of our work. But then the other half of us were really excited because this is what we have been waiting for, a freeze. So if you check out these pictures, you can see that there are some brown canopies here. This is a dead tree. Here's a dead tree. There's little tiny, some of these saplings are dead that are dotting the landscape, some brown canopies here. So there was a mortality event that took place. But at the same time, if you know, there are still mangroves that are green. So we had to go straight to our nitrogen enriched trees and our control and our phosphorus trees. And what we did is just a quick proportion of canopy that was brown. So we just walked to every tree and said, this is how much of the canopy as you're looking down looks to be dead or is brown. And so the control trees, you had about six or about 70% of the canopy that was dead. In the phosphorus trees, you had about 80% of the canopy that was dead. And then when you got to the nitrogen trees, it was like 10% of the canopy was dead. We weren't expecting this, but it was a beautiful story because these trees that got big enough were able to buffer those cold winter temperatures. So if the canopy was big, you had that the area and the height, it stayed warm at the base of that tree. And that effectively protected it during those freezing temperatures. And so now we're like, what's going on? Nitrogen will survive, but the carbon or the control and the phosphorus will die. You know, what's going to happen with nutrient enrichment? But then something weird happens. Every year we go out and we measure shoot elongation. And essentially, you look at one branch off of the mangrove, and you just measure how much has grown over the last season. 
And so this is shoot elongation on the y-axis. This is centimeters a year. Down here on the x are the winter to winter growth periods. So right here, oh, and then we have the nitrogen, which is in the triangles, and control and phosphorus, which are in the circles and the squares. And so right here on this winter, 2017 to 2018, this is where the freeze happens. Well, everything's brown, everything's dead. Wow, this has changed our story. We go out the next winter, take our measurements, and there is a huge increase in growth in all of the trees, not just the nitrogen, but the phosphorus and the control. And so what happens? This increase in growth made no sense until we've thought about the fact that those canopies that were brown, that brown canopy, those leaves, they eventually fell off directly under those mangrove trees. Those leaves have nutrients in them. There's nitrogen, there's phosphorus, there's carbon. And so those leaves actually acted as a nutrient subsidy for the growth of these mangroves. And so mother nature was kind of helping to fix what had happened in the ecosystem. And so this story is still ever evolving. Um, we have to go out again and take measurements after this period. So just this next upcoming winter, just to see where these mangroves, where things are playing out. And so this is actually supposed to be one heck of a cold winter up there. So stand by for any updates on the saga of these mangroves marching north, coupled with the nutrient enrichment. But if I had to generalize the last slides, what we're seeing up north is that there's a decrease in the intensity, duration, and frequency of winter climate change. And when that is coupled with hurricanes, we're seeing an increased encroachment of mangroves into the salt marsh ecosystem, which is being aided by nutrient enrichment. And so as you're changing the system from salt marsh to mangrove, you're going to see alterations in the species structure and productivity, which is eventually going to lead to shifts in ecosystem service provisioning. And so one of the questions I get all the time is what does this mean? You know, is this encroachment a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do we like mangroves? Do we like salt marsh? And so to get at that question, we really have to talk about the systems and what they provide for us or provide to the environment. So mangroves versus salt marsh, they're both marine ecosystems. They both function or they both cycle nutrients, chemicals, the flow of energy, uh, biological productivity. They are the niche and refuge and habitat for many species. Their structure is used by not only living communities, but also non-living components. And so if you couple those together, they both offer these and they both provide ecosystem services. The goods are fish harvest, clean water or water quality, a genetic material. Personally, they offer us recreation, tourism, fisheries, coastal protection, erosion control, pollution control, habitat provisioning, um, carbon storage. And so because they both offer the same ecosystem services, which is quote unquote better? You can't answer that question because they both give the same things. However, it's the structure that dictates the magnitude of that function. So if you look at the salt marsh, this is in Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. This is the Despicolous Marsh. Then look at St. Lucie Inlet State Park. These are a bunch of red mangroves. You have herbaceous grasses and succulent forbs that every year they die back. So they don't have a big above ground biomass capacity, right? Whereas you have woody mangroves, which are tropical evergreens with this huge network of roots and this large canopy. These trees right here, they're about 16 feet tall. And we know from literature that a three foot mangrove can have roots that extend up to 20 feet. And so when we're talking about structure, mangroves just have so much more of it. And so the magnitude of services that mangroves can pro provide is in a lot of cases greater just because of that structure. So let's just go through a few examples of these ecosystem services that are performed by both mangroves and salt marshes. The first one would be storm protection. So storm comes in, you have rising tides. As the sea comes through these mangroves 
it enters, right? And as it enters, it loses energy as it passes through this long tangled above ground roots or all these biomass. And the height of that wave is rapidly diminished. So, and as this happens, waves lose the ability to scour the land and pull up sediments that they would eventually pull back out. And they also act to reduce the wind across the surface of water that is going to, or that would eventually actually reform waves. And so, by having these mangrove systems, it's been shown that they can reduce wave height up to 66% during a storm event. And this is really important, especially today, because there's supposed to be forecasted increases in the intensity and duration of storms, so these hurricanes and cyclones. And here's just the shameless plug for living shorelines. If you have mangroves in front of your properties, you are effectively protecting your assets behind those mangroves. Without those mangroves, you are not going to see the diminishment of those waves. And essentially, you are potentially will see the disappearing of your assets. And so this guy or this researcher worked out that globally, mangroves provide flood, flood protection that exceed about $65 billion a year. And if mangroves were lost everywhere, 15 million more people would be flooded annually across the world. And so this just demonstrates how something so simple has such a big impact on our livelihoods. But let's get back to the difference between mangroves and salt marsh. So we had a collaborator do a study um, in Merritt Island, and she looked at the difference between wave attenuation between mangroves and salt marsh in Merritt Island. And what she found here, she was looking at um, wave height attenuated, and she did a very conservative wave height. It was, um, I think, like 1.6 feet, like two feet tall. And then she looked at the distance. So at zero, this is right along the water, out to about 40 meters. And she ran a model. And what she found was that it takes um, 55 feet to attenuate 90% of that wave height. So 90% of that 1.6 feet, where if you were in the salt marsh habitat, whereas it takes only 5.6 feet in mangrove habitat to attenuate that 90% of the wave. And so just a, this is just showing that this function is intimately tied to the structure. So just the big above ground biomass is really helping to protect these coastal areas from storms. This is also really tied to erosion prevention. So as I mentioned earlier, as these waves come through in these systems, they scour the land. And as they bring up sediments and pull up plants, those are eventually pulled back out into the water when the water moves back out. And so she also found, and don't get too bogged down in a lot of this, I know that it, it didn't translate very well, but this is total erosion avoided and yellow is mangrove, green is in salt marsh. And what she found was erosion prevention was 470% higher in the mangrove habitat than in the salt marsh habitat. And so what this mangrove vegetation does is it reduces that wave energy and it slows that flow of water over the soil surface. And so it won't dislodge those sediments and carry them out of that area. And at the same time, as it's slowing it down, the water might sit longer. And if there's any suspended solids in that water, they'll eventually fall out. And then that water will move, leaving the sediments behind. She calculated that if mangroves were put in place of man-made structures, whether it be riprap, seawalls, bulkheads, it would equate to a savings of more than $4.9 million in terms of erosion prevention staggering numbers when you start to think about it. And so this ecosystem service snowballs into the process of sediment accretion. So if you're, if you're not losing sediment, if mangroves are stopping sediment from losing the system, you're likely gaining it, right? And this is a hallmark of a healthy system. And so these researchers, they looked at sediment accretion and retention um, in four different um, locations. And what you have here on the y-axis is vertical sediment accretion, and then this is just over time on the x-axis. Mangrove is in black, salt marsh is in the dashed line, and in every single instant, 
there was an increase in sediment in the mangroves more so than in the salt marsh system. So this was over three years. And the differences that we're seeing were only millimeters, right, over those three years. There was several millimeters more soil or sediment in these systems than in mangrove or than in salt marshes. But this makes a huge difference when we're talking about keeping pace with sea level rise. And so every system is different. So the degree of accretion is could be very different depending on where you are. But these warming temperatures that we're seeing in our atmosphere are leading to an increase in sea level, which means that someone like us that live in Florida, we're going to need to move to higher ground at a certain point. But mangroves may be able to help mitigate that by accreting more sediment over um, a yearly period. And so another ecosystem service that ties into that accretion conversation um, is that of carbon storage. So mangroves sequester atmospheric carbon to form their leaves, their stems, their branches, and they do this through photosynthesis. So they pull carbon out of the atmosphere so that CO2 comes out of the atmosphere. They sequester it into their biomass. And so you have vast quantities that are tied up in these living trees. Well, these trees die, leaves fall off, and what they do is these, the wood, the roots, the leaves, they fall into the water. And unlike many other forests, they could actually store the carbon that fell into the water away for a long period of time because decomposition is very slow in these systems. And this is because of the saline water log conditions that just prevent decomposition. And so these mangroves are actually seen as a critical for long-term storage and sequestration of carbon as they remove it from the atmosphere and store it in their soils. As they store it in their soils though, because it doesn't decompose, so it doesn't leave the system, that means that it stays there. And as it stays there, it builds on top of one another over time. So over centuries, millennia, what we actually see is that mangroves grow up in vertical relief, in vertical profile. So if you leave this sediment undisturbed, this serves as a long-term carbon sink for atmospheric carbon that would otherwise remain in the atmosphere and exacerbate climate change. So what do we see here in Florida in terms of mangroves and salt marsh? After doing an extensive survey along the Atlantic coast, we found that there's 32% more carbon in mangrove above ground biomass than in salt marsh. So this is total carbon. This is megagrams of carbon per hectare on the y-axis. Here we have just mangrove species and salt marsh species. You can see that the soils were pretty much the same to 50 centimeters. But then on top of that, there's a huge increase in carbon due to that above ground biomass storage. And so mangroves have more carbon due to their structure, right? We've, I've been hammering this all night. More biomass above ground in their roots, their shoots, and their leaves. But how does this play out in general along the Atlantic coast here? Well, part of the survey was looking at mangroves and salt marsh from Palm Beach all the way up to the St. Johns County. And so what is, this is Palm Beach up to St. Augustine. And what we found was that along the stretch of coastline, mangroves only covered about a third of the area studied, and they stored about 44% of the total carbon, whereas salt marsh occupied about two thirds of the wetland area, but only stored 55% of the total carbon. So mangroves stored more carbon in a smaller area. So then it begged the question, what happens if mangroves take over all of the salt marsh? Let's go back to that study that we talked about earlier. 2015, it was all salt marsh. Went back to 2018, 252 individuals after only three years. When we pulled it all together, when we looked at the difference in soil carbon, the difference in below ground biomass, BGB, the difference in above ground biomass, AGB, there was a 68% increase in total carbon stock between 2015 and 2018. So before, when it was just salt marsh only, 
there was not as much carbon that was being stored. But the second, three years later, when you had sapling mangroves that had moved in, you saw a 68% increase in that carbon that could be stored for long term. What does that mean in just basic lay terms? It's kind of hard to put a number or to talk about carbon floating around in the atmosphere. So I found that the EPA has a greenhouse gas equivalency calculator. And what it said is that that 68% increase in carbon storage is equivalent to mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions from a passenger car that drives 127,000 miles. Now that's just one car. We're just talking about one hectare of area. There are 64, uh, and wait, one hectare is 2.4 acres. There are 64,000 acres of salt marsh in Florida. So if mangroves moved in and outcompeted salt marsh, that carbon capture potential is huge and can increase over time with that increase in below ground sediments. So the expansion feedbacks that, you know, they're both wonderful systems and one is not better than the other. They both offer the same ecosystem services. But what we have seen is that if mangroves move in, just based on their structure alone, you're gonna see increased carbon storage, increased erosion prevention, increased storm protection, and sea level rise mitigation. I will say that I haven't touched on other ecosystem processes, whether it's water quality, nutrient cycling, fisheries, habitat for birds. So there's a lot more work that we do need to look into and people are doing it all over the world. So in conclusion, if we take nothing else from today's conversation, I hope that you can walk away knowing that mangrove expansion is a very dynamic process, and it has been resulting in several positive feedbacks to global climate change. There's a lot more work to be done in this system, um, but regardless, I hope that no matter what, this conversation gave you a whole newfound appreciation for these beautiful, important trees that we see everywhere and we just drive by in our boats and our car and don't pay them much attention. I do need to acknowledge the many, many people that made all of this work possible and a special thanks to Dr. Candy Feller. This story was her vision and all of us were so lucky to be a part of her journey. And so she's first and foremost, and I know that I forgot so many people on this slide because there are just masses of people that made all this work possible. A special thanks to our funding sources, NSF and NASA, as well as all of the project participants um, and project partners. And so with that, I would love to take any questions. And if you don't know how to get them into words tonight and you wanna chat later, please feel free to send me an email. Thank you. All right, Larray, unbelievable job. Um, that was such a phenomenal lecture. I think that if we we're in front of the library with all of our guests there, you'd be hearing a roaring round of applause right now. I know it's a little bit weird to speak without the feedback of an audience in front of you, but phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. I'm really, really excited to start going through some of these questions. But I, first and foremost, just wanted to thank you for giving us your evening tonight. I know you work for Florida Oceanographic Society, but you are still a guest speaker tonight. And as, as our guest, I really appreciate a phenomenal presentation. Uh, so thank my first that. question that I have is, okay. let me see here. Um, you mentioned multispectral high resolution satellite imagery, and you also talk <laughs> yep. about aerial photography. Uh -huh. What exactly is that satellite imagery? What do you get from it? Can you explain a little bit about that? Oh, that's a great question. That is not my wheelhouse, but essentially there's a bunch of satellites that float around in the atmosphere and they're constantly taking pictures. Those pictures, we are able to take them and discern from these pictures to very fine resolution to almost a three meter resolution whether or not something is a mangrove or a salt marsh. And so you get this data from NASA, and then you have to go out with your GPS and stand over a tree and say, this is a tree, this is a salt marsh, and you do this all over the place. And then you get back into the lab, and then you tell the computer at this GPS point, this is a tree. At this GPS, this is a salt marsh. And then the computer runs the program and is able to say exactly what is a tree and what is a salt marsh 
based on the color spectrum that those satellites have picked up. All right, our next question is much easier. When you were doing your beach surveys looking for propagules on the beach, you mentioned rack line. What exactly is a rack line? So when you're walking along the beach and you're looking for your shells and there's kind of that, it's sargasm. So it's a, the plant, it's a floating plant from the ocean. Usually by the time you're walking through it, it might be dead, it might smell a little bit. We've actually seen a huge increase in these sargasm mats or sargasm rack lines in the last few years. And essentially it's just the term for anything that floats up and is left at that high tide mark. So you're gonna get any sort of plant, you might see a jellyfish wash up in it, but those mangroves, they'll get stuck in the structure of that rack line and that will help push them somewhere. And in a lot of cases we've found that the rack line will protect the mangroves. It will keep them cool and it won't allow them to desiccate so they might be able to last longer if they're underneath that rack line canopy. Great. All right, here's a great question. Uh, how do you think the mangroves got from Cedar Key all the way around Florida to Matanzas Inlet? Great. I am not uh, privy to all of the currents in Florida, but I have to imagine that somehow, some way, it was able to get around the peninsula of Florida and hit that Gulf Stream, and that took it where it needed to go. And then couple that with storm surges and prevailing winds, and next thing you know, it's in um, St. Augustine. And there's been papers that have also shown that mangroves have made it from Cuba up to Florida, from the Bahamas to Florida, and so these mangroves, they can get around. They're pretty impressive. All right, so we've had a pretty cold start to the winter of 2020, 2021. Have there been any freezes yet that have affected mangroves in North Central Florida? So there was one that it was, I think two weeks ago, that was just like a day or two and it didn't do anything. But we got really like excited about it. And so what we did was we ran out and we took a bunch of temperature loggers and we put temperature loggers above the salt marsh canopy and below the salt marsh canopy where these mangroves are, just to see if there's differences in those microclimates. So if mangrove propagules get in under those salt marsh canopies, the betas, does it actually act to warm those propagules so they can persist on to the next generation? And so we may be losing some of these bigger trees as the, they or the defoliated, but are the, is the salt marsh actually protecting the seedlings under that? So there's so many more questions and we're so excited to keep this project going. So you're excited about freezing your mangroves. Yes, which hopefully is soon. But I have the hobos out. They can last for about 274 days right now. So we'll get something. All right, so one of our viewers has a question about what can be done in built up areas where seawalls and riprap shoreline have, have essentially replaced historical mangrove line shorelines? Um, well, it doesn't make much sense to start pulling out seawalls. That's a huge time commitment of huge resource investment. I would suggest that if we're talking about shoreline protection and erosion control, um, habitat provisioning, to plant a mangrove in front of that seawall and have a hybrid um, living shoreline is just as effective as just not having that shoreline or that seawall there. And so, yes, you're not, you may not have the same slope, but you're still offering that habitat with the tree that wasn't there before. And that's the same as putting them in riprap. You can put, if you plant mangroves in the riprap, you can trim them to a certain height and you will be able to get those services even though you've already shored up your shoreline. All right, so you were talking about ecosystem services that are provided by mangroves and salt marsh. And on the list, I, I think there was a, a genetic material was listed. And mm -hmm. the, the guest is curious what you, what you meant by genetic material as an ecosystem service. Yeah, so I think if we take um, a crop, for example, let's say a clonal crop like bananas. We have bananas, they all have the same genetics. 
And so at a certain point, if something happens, if a fungus breaks out, that has the potential to kill all of those bananas, right? If we are able to increase the genetic material, so increase the different genotypes in a system so it's not a monoculture, we will effectively be able to save a population potentially if something was to go wrong or if some, something did break out and potentially kill everything. And so we just wanna see an increase in that genetic material because that will help the resilience of that population over time, as opposed to if there was just one uh, genotype throughout the entire species. All right, we, we seem to have a couple of questions popping up that are related to your, your last question and answer about you know, replacing mangrove forests with seawalls and riprap and then what's being done to, to reverse some of that. Uh, a guest asks, if you're a local waterfront homeowner, what's the best time of year? Or what season is best to plant mangrove seeds and propagules? And then related to that, are private landowners along waterfront areas allowed to plant mangroves on their own property? So those are two good questions, two different viewers, but we're very related. Yes. Yeah. Well, the best time to plant a mangrove propagule is right around when they fall off the tree. So you're, that's what early fall, winter time. I just had mangrove plantings here where we have volunteers that come out and they plant mangrove propagules and we just did that in December. And so we planted like 600 baby propagules, which was really cool. Um, so that would be the best time. But if you found a mangrove propagule still floating today, it could still potentially be viable, especially if it's a red mangrove. So if you're walking down the beach and you see one, go ahead and stick it in the ground, see what happens. In terms of homeowners planting their own propagules, I, I'm not gonna speak on that because I really don't even think a man or a homeowner has to do that. Mother nature will get a propagule there at some point, some way. Um, but I actually don't know if there is a regulation I think you're not allowed to take them off of the trees and plant them, but if you found one floating around, I think you're okay. But I have a feeling I'm gonna get an email from DEP after this. So stand by on that, I'll get back to you. Send me an email. All right, still along kind of the same line of questioning. Uh, one guest asks, I, I like to try to help plant mangroves to stabilize sandbar areas in the Indian River Lagoon. Will this help establish new trees, and also which end should I stick in the sand? And there's actually more than one person who's asked which end is the top of a mangrove, red mangrove propagule, and which end is the bottom? So that's a very, very important question if you're gonna to try to replant these on your own. This is a very important question. And when we're talking about the red mangroves, brown goes down. And so the bottom of the red mangrove has kind of a brown coloration that goes in the soil. And then if you look at it closely, you'll actually see the very top of the mangrove, so the opposite end, those are the leaves already. They're there. They're just kind of tiny and folded over on each other. So just look closer, but yeah, brown goes down. Um, in terms of where to plant mangroves, it, if we're planting them on like a random sandbar in a very um, high energy place, they're probably not gonna do very well. They're gonna, they need some time to establish. So they can't be a lot of waves, there can't be a lot of boat wake. And so they're not gonna do very well there. And it just really, like, it just really depends on where you're planting them. They would prefer to be in a place that was not high velocity. All right, uh, are there any rules in place to protect current mangrove areas from development or removal or over pruning or trimming? Yeah, there are a lot of regulations when it comes to taking mangroves out as well as cutting them to certain um, levels. If you can't just go and pull up a bunch of mangroves to build a home, you have to go through a lot of processes and there's a lot of mitigation that goes into that. But I hope that we noted from this conversation that building in a house where there was a mangrove prior probably isn't a good idea because those waves one day, they're gonna come and they're gonna get you, so. You know, I, I can say that in, in my years on the water working in the Indian River Lagoon, I've, I've had a number of instances where I found mangroves that were illegally removed. And in, in every case, the DEP issued some pretty, pretty severe penalties for the people that removed those mangroves. So thankfully here in Florida, our, our government is doing a reasonably good job of trying to enforce those rules and regulations. 
Here's if a fantastic question. If you have any questions about the rules and regulations, just go on the DEP website. I had a feeling this was going to come up, so I did have one little slide, but you just go down here, DEP, suburb land, blah, 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 and mangrove frequently asked questions, and they'll answer a lot of questions that you may have on this. So this is, this is a great question from one of our viewers. It's actually one that, that I was going to chat with you about tomorrow. Are there any impacts to specific species, particularly imperiled species, that are anticipated by this shift from salt marsh to mangrove? Hmm. Oh, we're probably talking about some sort of critter, charismatic megafauna. Yeah, I would, I would imagine probably, probably critter, but maybe another important plant that's being pushed out too. So in terms of plants, as mentioned, you know, this is a really harsh environment that mangroves and salt marsh live in. And there aren't very many plants that can survive there. You know, saline water, so salt water, you're underwater twice a day. For some are under a lot of water twice a day. And so there is only a handful of species that can live in this system, which is really nice for me because I don't have to learn as many plants as I would if I was a terrestrial biologist or ecologist. Um, so in terms of plants, that's definitely not a concern. In terms of animals, I can't speak on that. I know that there has been work that has looked at um, differences in foraging behavior of, say, bats. So bats that forage over a salt marsh, I think they're being affected by this incoming of mangroves because now the mangroves are stop or slowing or disrupting their ecolocation. Um, so there are conversations that are being had, but I think a lot of it also comes down to that not necessarily displacing species, but the species are just shifting a little bit to take care of that niche. So you're not losing them because the species are just, let's say the salt marsh species that are being encroached upon, they're just moving north to stay in their habitat that they're comfortable in. And then the species from down south, like the mangrove tree crab, that has been found to move north and has actually been shown to be another food source for red drum up in St. Augustine. And so just like these other ecosystem services, there's nothing terribly detrimental. It's just the degree of the service that is being altered. All right, our next question is about temperature tolerance. Is there a difference in temperature tolerance among Florida's three mangrove species? There is, great question. I do not know those numbers off the top of my head, but I can tell you that the black mangrove has a much wider tolerance than the other two mangroves. So, and that's why we're seeing the black mangrove up north and proliferating more than we do the white and the red mangrove. Great question. Here's another great question from an ecological perspective. Do mangroves and salt marsh plants produce toxins that inhibit the growth of competing plants? Oh, great question. Not that I am aware of. This is not the Brazilian pepper of the salt marsh. <laughs> uh, yes, mangroves do have tannins, but that is nothing that concentrates enough, from my understanding, to inhibit the growth of anything else. All right, so here's, here's a question about somebody who's seen a condo community where the tops of mangrove trees were trimmed off, and they're wondering why that was done. Is that help their growth, like pruning a, a, a citrus tree in your garden, or is there some other ulterior, ulterior let's try that for a third time, ulterior motive for taking the tops off of mangrove trees? Oh, well, probably that top was in the way of somebody's view. And if it fell between in between the six foot, 10 foot feet in height, you can, with a professional, lop off the top so you can see over those mangrove trees. And so in a lot of cases, when we're talking about someone that lives on the water in a condo, they still want to enjoy their view. And so there are mechanisms in place to be able to cut off the top and kind of shrub the mangroves per se. All right, and my, my last question for you, Dr. Simpson, is what is your job title and what kind of research tasks do you do? And I, I think I might know the nature of that kind of question. We have lots of audience members tonight and sometimes we have people that have interesting careers in this line of work. So just a guess, but that might be where that question's coming from. All right, well, I am first and foremost a mangrove ecologist. 
that is my forte. But in in a general sense, I'm just um, a marine ecologist. So I'm really interested in understanding how the marine systems act and how they function, whether it's their structure and how that changes and how that changes their functioning. So I work in salt marsh, I work in mangroves, I work in oysters, I work in seagrasses, and just trying to better understand how all of these systems, especially here in the Indian River Lagoon and the St. Lucie Estuary, how they are affected by one another as well as the water quality in this area. I'm really interested in just understanding how if you throw a disturbance at something or you alter its structure, how the ecosystem shifts or how it tries to fix that. I think that we are throwing so many hardballs or you know, monkey wrenches at these systems that in order to really understand that we really need to do the research to understand what we're doing. And that begins in the lab, in mesocosm studies right out back here, as well as out in the field. And there's just so many questions to ask and literally not enough time. So um, I'm excited to be here at FOS and to really see where we can go in terms of ecological restoration in this and research in this area. Alrighty. Well, again, I want to thank Dr. Simpson for uh, spending her evening with us. It's such a fascinating presentation. I mean, I, I learned a ton and I've, I've spent a lot of time working in these same ecosystems. So I'm hoping that you guys learned a lot as well. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to email Lorraine. I know she'd be thrilled to, to spend some time offline with, with your questions. And then my last reminder, I hope all of you will be here next week for Dr. Kenny Broad's presentation. I, I'm really excited about this one. He is a, a world-class undersea explorer, and I, I think you're all going to be blown away by, by his lecture. So hopefully you guys will sign up. Again, if you've missed any of our previous lectures, or if you'd like to watch this again or share it with a friend, all of our Coastal Lecture Series videos will be posted online, usually two or three days after we record them. All right, everybody, thank you again. Thanks, Dr. Simpson, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful evening.